During the last two episodes, we've stressed how important it is to make your first game something small. But this is so important that this time we're going to dedicate the entire episode to it. This will serve you in good stead not only when you're creating your first game, but also when prototyping for anything else you do. In development, there's a term called minimum viable product, which refers to the smallest thing you can possibly make that'll still give you useful data once released. That should be your goal. Even when James is called in to work on a multi-million dollar project that has a development time of three years, one of the first things he'll tell them is that if they don't have a prototype up in the first three weeks, they're doing it wrong. When you can actually play your game, you'll discover all sorts of things that you didn't account for when you were just designing the game in your head. You'll find edge cases where your mechanics are broken, or places where your game just falls apart. You'll find what's really engaging rather than just trying to build something that you hope is engaging. And you'll discover what will add the most to the experience you're creating. Okay, so you've heard me say cut and cut and cut, and that when you think you're done cutting, you're probably not done cutting. But you do have to stop cutting sometimes, so how do we determine when we're down to that minimum viable product? Well, this one is a bit tough, and you're gonna get better at it with experience, but the basic idea is to find the absolute minimum set of features that won't affect core development. If you could cut a feature and still technically ship your game, it's probably not part of your minimum viable product. But because this is as much an art as it is a science, let's run through some examples so we're all on the same footing. Let's start with Super Mario Bros. What do we need in order to test if the fundamental gameplay of Super Mario Bros. is engaging? What's the minimum that we can build and test before deciding if what we have is something worth expanding upon with additional features? Well, do we need Koopas? No. Fire Flowers? Nope. Bowser? Nope. Pipes that you can climb down? No. Pipes at all? Mm, no. Water levels, mushrooms, hidden blocks, extra lives? No, 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 no. So what do we need? Well, for Mario, the minimum viable product is probably one level where you can move, jump, and fall into pits. That's it. If just that much is engaging, you'll be able to add all those other features later and make it even better. But if running along and jumping over pits doesn't feel good, Super Mario Bros. simply doesn't work, no matter how many extra features you throw in so you've got to make sure that that core is working first. Although, in this particular case, I'd probably throw in two other features that aren't strictly necessary, but they will make a big difference. First, a trigger which resets the level if the player falls into the pit, just so testing is easier, and to make sure that this aspect isn't just unpalatable to players. And second, the ability to change from walking to running, since the Mario jump mechanic is so dependent on the run button. But that's it. One level, three features, and you've got a game. Don't believe something this simple could be engaging? Well, set the character to auto-run, and you've basically built Cannibalt. When building your first game, or prototyping a larger one, you'll find that you can strip out all of the content, all of the things that aren't rules that control the play itself, but rather elements that are created out of those rules. So enemy types, levels, different weapons, all of that can usually get cut. You might want to include one thing from each category just to test the larger rules, but no more than that, because it's really easy to get mired down in making all of that content. And the truth is, games with lots of content but without a solid foundation are rarely good. Perhaps worse, as a creator, when your game's packed with content, it's generally harder to figure out why the foundation's not working. If you test your prototype with a lot of content thrown in, it'll be harder for players to put their fingers on exactly what it is that needs improvement, as all of that content just clutters what's wrong, and they'll be more likely to tell you about bad pieces of content rather than the underlying reasons why that content didn't create a positive experience. It just adds complexity in a situation where you really need to be honing your game's core foundation. Okay, so let's try another one. Old school JRPGs. Now this one can fool people because most designers tend to think of these games in terms of content rather than gameplay. It's easy to get caught up in the story you want to tell, or the massive lists of items and enemies. But if the player has to slog through 80 hours of weak gameplay in order to access that story you've got in mind, you've done your player a disservice. In fact, that's some of what's contributed to the decline in the popularity of traditional JRPGs this decade. So take a game like Final Fantasy IV. Here, I would cut everything but the menu-based combat system. I would even cut out all the graphics. Monsters can just be words on the screen. That's really all you need to test the system. Now, many of you might object, saying, but that doesn't work. I can't make that engaging without the content. This is actually great, though. It immediately tells us that we should probably find a more robust system. All right, let's try one more. This time, let's look at Ikaruga. 
Here, we could probably cut down to the color switching mechanic, an enemy which switches color randomly and shoots random bullet patterns, or maybe randomly chooses from a small list of pre-built bullet patterns, as that wouldn't be too hard to construct. Also, you'll need the ability for the player to move and to shoot, a counter which ticks upward as you shoot the enemy, and a death mechanic that simply resets the game when the player gets hit. This will get you all the player behavior you need to find out if your game's engaging. Your players will try to dodge and shoot the enemy while attempting to take advantage of the color swapping system as much as possible. That's all you need. Hopefully, that helps you frame your thinking about just how small your first project should be. Now I'm going to give you a quick and dirty list of game genres, ordered by how difficult they are to create a minimum viable product for. And this is only going to apply to digital games. Some of these genres are actually much easier to build pen into paper or board games for. Also, this list isn't by any means absolute. As game engines change, this list is going to become outdated, but it should give you a place to start at least. So, game genres in order of difficulty to produce a minimum viable product, from simplest to most difficult. Racing game, top-down shooter, 2D platformer, Color Matching Puzzle Game, 2D Puzzle Platformer, 3D Platformer, FPS, JRPG, Fighting Game, Action Adventure, Western RPG, RTS. I'm leaving out point-and-click adventure games here, as those games are entirely built out of content. So while getting a point-and-click game up and running is relatively easy, getting anything together that'll actually tell you if you're onto something engaging is a lot harder. You'll notice I'm also leaving out anything networked or multiplayer, as that generally multiplies the complexity. Honestly, I would just recommend avoiding multiplayer stuff entirely for your first game. And again, don't think of these genres in terms of the games you know. When I say racing game, don't think Gran Turismo. Think two gray blocks on a black background with acceleration and collision mechanics. That is all you need to hit that minimum viable product or prototype stage, where you can really start to get it out there and play it and learn what's needed to improve it. You can always build from there later and add more cool features, but your game will be better off for having spent the time testing and refining the foundation of your game idea. This is way more productive than dreaming up a project which is far too big to ever tackle. Hopefully that helps you decide where to start and how far to scope down. Join us on the next episode for what to do once you're done with your game. See you then!